it does seem to be hailing outside, so if there's rumbling in the background, that that's what that is. Hello there, and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. And please forgive me for the mess. Um, I'm still working on embroidering the brocade jacket for the Verdigree lookbook, but I actually want to talk about a different project first because I'm kind of doing this whole collection in stages. And one of the first things I made for Verdigree was actually the pieced and color blocked leather jacket. Although I knew the 99K machine could handle sewing with leather, I wasn't sure that I could because I'd never sewn with leather before, at least sewn seamed objects with leather before. So I wanted to kind of ease my way into working with leather by trying to make a color block leather jacket where the rest of it was cotton twill and therefore perfectly easy enough to sew. But I'll show you exactly how I went about pattern drafting this jacket and then the color blocked design on top of it over on the blue patterning table of doom as always. And as usual, I begin with my basic bodice block, two dart front here, single dart back. Let's go. Go ahead and trace a copy of this. And I'm thinking, oh wait, I need to trace a mirrored copy of this because we need a full front because this front of this jacket is going to be asymmetric in that it's kind of like double breasted but without um buttons because I never used I don't really like double breasted things with like the six or eight buttons down the front I don't know I, I, I'm not a huge button person all the time it's like my weird relationship with pockets um I'm just deciding on the angle of our both neckline and yoke up here and then I'll decide the angle down across the front of this buddy down into the waist so have that come at quite an angle down draw on my darts here so I can start moving those around. We are going to change this into a princess seam today. I just need to move this dart over about a half inch. For some reason, I'm hesitating on that. Yeah, just move it over. There we go. So I'm going to tilt this over a half inch, which means this is my new dart leg, and this needs to come out the same amount over here so that I have my dart just shifted over towards the side a little bit. And then, of course, the side dart um, along the side seam here will be closed completely when we separate this. Um, measuring the neckline here, just marking that for future reference because I do need to make a collar for this. Later on, I, I don't even do that during the pattern drafting process. I wait until I have half this jacket sewn before I even make the collar pattern because, you know, doing things in weird order for this project. This was back in, oh, I don't know, March, if not earlier, that I made this. So forgive me if I forget anything that was going on. Uh, this has been a long time coming, this project, and most of Vertigree. I'm going to lower that arm side 5 eighths of an inch and then bring out the shoulder 1 fourth of an inch. You see me do this all the time with... Um, jackets and anything I want to have more structured shoulder and I also brought the side seam out a quarter of an inch as well just to give me a little bit more ease in this because again it will be outerwear um, it won't be too too thick although this cotton twill that I used for this is on the, the thicker side um, I grabbed it originally to make I'm adding seam allowance to the yoke here since I cut it off um, and also to the bodice pattern where I cut it off from if you cut things apart you have to add seam allowance to be able to sew them back together you know the rules um, but this dark brownish green uh, cotton twill that is the base of this jacket today. I originally got it a couple years ago to make a like army green pencil skirt, but it's just was even a little bit too thick for that. So a hardier jacket actually kind of makes sense. So rough and ready. I'm going to go ahead and cut the center front piece away from the side front here. Of course, I need to add seam allowance to that. So I'll do that first here before I forget. And then the other side we can transform fully into our princess seam situation. I will go ahead and link in the description below the princess seam video all about how to use princess seams instead of darts. Although you're about to see me do it here, I'm just not going to do it as slowly or as meticulously as I might normally. So I'm going to cut my dart fullness away, close this side dart as well. So I cut my waist dart away completely, close this side dart, we start getting a princess seamed looking uh, garment here. This is of course a shoulder princess, technically, as opposed to an armhole princess, like so. All right, of course this bust is extremely pointy at this point. I'm going to add seam allowance on and then I will just take off a tiny bit of that point over the bust. Um, there's official ways to do this. This is not the official way to do it. This is just the way I'm going to do it today because I know what works for me and my body. And there's a few more steps that are supposed to be involved in here, but eh, I'm just going to round this off over the tip and everything's going to be fine. That's right. I will go ahead and walk this seam and then add some notches in here, which I did completely behind my head. So I'm just going to skip ahead to with those notches being drawn in because of course I need to line these up later when they're done with fabric. Yeah. Good job showing us how to do the notches completely behind your head, you dum-dum. And you can tell this was a while ago because I still have my hair longer. Uh, of course, I've cut it into a bit of a, I don't know, is it a pixie? Sure. I, I have no idea what this haircut is called um, compared to back when I had my bob here. Now, to create the, from the waist down of the jacket, basically a peplum. Uh, there's not really a difference between a peplum. A peplum is like when you do this section over another skirt, but really, same idea. Grabbing the front of my A-line skirt pattern, tracing like the first, I don't know, what is that, nine inches of that. I'll tape on a bit of extra paper here so I can line up the center front of 
where that A-line skirt would be and kind of continue my line from the front bodice down so that I can have that angle be the same and just continue it down into this skirt portion of the jacket, the peplum portion of the jacket. Um, I'm going to flare out the side a tiny bit uh, eventually. This is going to be five and a half inches long at the side seam and then I'm just going to dip it down into an angle I like here in the front. I end up redrawing that in a minute anyway. Yeah, let's go a little bit lower and I just do a hatch mark on the line I want to keep so I can keep everything straight here. And I'll draw in my center front, which you cannot really see here on camera, just so I know where it is later on, especially when I'm cutting this out and I want, if I want to cut it out on grain, I need to know where that grain should be. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and cut this piece out. All right, move scraps aside. Let's go ahead and work on the back of the jacket now. I'm going to trace my back bodice block, including the dart. Add in that quarter inch along the side. Again, lower the arm side, five eighths of an inch, bring out the shoulder one fourth of an inch and connect that down. And then here's my dart, which we will again, transform into a princess seam on the back here as well. But I will add in a back yoke as well, like so. Continue that princess seam up into that yoke, like so. That back yoke is, well, I don't know, one, two, three, four and a half inches wide or tall, as it were. Of course, this doesn't need to have a center back seam, but I will have one today. Um, just because of wanting it to be extra detailed and having more space for top stitching, not necessarily because of any functional reason. Um, of course, the more seaming you add, you can fit these pieces onto smaller pieces of fabric if you have weirdly shaped yardage or anything like that, if you're using leftover um, fabric from another project. Sometimes adding in details like a yoke or princess seaming means you can use a fabric that if you had kept the pieces large, you know, you wouldn't be able to fit it on there. Cut off the yoke, add seam allowance, cut apart that back princess seam, including just cutting that dart fullness off. Again, see the princess seam video in the description for a for a longer description of adding the princess seam to either the front or the back of the bodice like this. And again, those uh, new style lines will need seam allowance, so I'm putting that on there as well. And we have our back pattern here. I'm just going to walk this seam, make sure everything lines up. Again, you can put notches on that. If the curve in the back is much more subtle, so I don't usually put notches on that, buddy, because I am kind of lazy, as we know. Once again, I'm going to grab my A-line skirt back, just square off a line here, and Trace the top of this to create the back from the waist down for this jacket. Again, just trace that like so. I do keep an A-line skirt copy of my pattern just sitting here next to my drafting area. I need to make one out of card, but I don't have a roll of manila paper yet. Maybe in my next studio. Uh, they did They did in fashion school. You can see I'm just matching the flare of the back skirt to the front, uh, just so it flares out a tiny bit more at the side. And again, I'm going to draw in the angle to the center back and then draw it in a tiny bit lower again. Same thing I did in the front. But this is going to be my little back skirt peplumy portion of this jacket again. One day I'll learn the actual terminology for everything. It's just not today. You would think I would know because I went to fashion school, but they mostly covered the basics in fashion school. And I don't think we ever got to jackets at all in my pattern drafting classes, which is a sh real shame uh, because I would have loved to learn more about jackets and tailoring. I'm going to trace a copy of my standard sleeve here, which has its elbow dart in the back, as you can see. I'm going to come out four inches towards the front along the center and then three inches toward the back. Why is it uneven? Oh. oh, look, here I came out four. Nice. Good job making it the same. I'm going to add a half inch to the wrist just to make it a little bit larger because this is, again, like outerwear, kind of a um, rough and ready leather jacket. I'll add in a inch to the hem of this as well. Just make sure it's long enough. If it covers my hands too much, that doesn't bother me. Um, this section I'm going to separate. I thought I was going to separate the bottom here into four. I just ended up separating it into two. The sleeve in general, in the twill at least, is three pieces. The top of the sleeve and the left and right on the bottom. But um, I wasn't sure how many pieces I wanted to do. So yeah, I'm going to kind of like add a yoke to my sleeve here. So I'm just separating this about, oh, I don't know, two inches above my elbow. I'm having the top of my sleeve here. This is basically a short sleeve at this point. And uh, again, if I'm going to cut my pieces apart, that's right. I need to add seam allowance so I can put them back together. So I'll do that. Oh, sorry, my, my chair is squeaking in the background. I absolutely desperately need to get myself a new office chair. But when it comes down to these things in life of like buying more sequins or buying an office chair, I think we know which I choose normally. And office chairs are more expensive than sequins are, which makes that choice quite easy. But I will go ahead and cut the front and back or left and right, whichever you want to go with, of the sleeve apart. And again, we'll add seam allowance because it's going to be sewn back together. That's right. Like so, always keep... keep I always keep my scraps of paper that are big enough to add seam allowance or do a little facing with or anything like that in a box beside my table back here. So I have a box of fabric scraps and I have a box of paper scraps where I just keep pieces that are big enough to do anything with. 
and start laying this out so this goes together like so and then I had to decide what I wanted to do for the pattern on this buddy. Um, so all of these pieces, let's, I'll show you using this uh, front yoke piece, everything is one inch away from the seam, anything that's going to be sewn into a seam, so the shoulder seam, the neckline here, um, the arm side, the yoke seam, that's all one inch away and then I created like a piece inside of that. So this is just one inch out from the outside basically, which will leave me of course after half inch seam allowance, a half inch around the piece. So similar idea with the other pieces going on on the uh, fronts here. So here on the center front, I have all these little stripes going down the center. Um, I just did two thicker stripes at the top and then thinner ones in the middle. Um, again, I'll talk about this in a second, but I, I didn't exactly super plan this. I just did it on the fly. Um, but these all have half inch spacing in between them. And then again, a one inch buffer around the outside edges where they need to be sewn into a seam, which again, will once sewn look like a half inch, which matches the spacing in between the other pieces. So that's good. Here on the peplum, I did two pieces kind of just following the angle of the peplum there. Um, but in general, deciding all these little designs was uh, something I did in the sketch stage. So I kind of just followed my own sketch, figuring out where I wanted these pieces to be. A few things changed. I think on the sketch, I have only two pieces in the back peplum. I did three in the end, um, which you're about to see me lay out right here. But yes, I have all these little pieces to show what I need to cut out of the leather. Everything is with that one inch buffer and then half inch apart. Um, and the pattern is just something I made up while sketching that I liked the look of. There's no uh, particular rhyme or reason to any of this. It's just what I thought might look good. I knew that I didn't uh, do a lot of panels on these side fronts where there would be a curve in the seam for the princess seam. I didn't do a lot of leather panels on the back sides. Um, that's both because A, anywhere the fabric was going to be butting up a curve a lot, I didn't want to get too much leather close to those curves because the fabric will mold to my body a lot better than the leather will. Because this is a bit of a thicker leather I'll be using today. I mean, it's definitely it's kind of variably thin and thick. I will link this leather below. So if you are interested in this exact one, I think they have one piece left at this shop. Um, again, I've never worked with it before, so it's not like I know a ton about these things. Um, but I also only had so much of it, so I didn't want to overload this with the panels because I knew I wasn't going to have enough to completely fill in the side and uh, side fronts and side backs. So this was my design for my panels in the end. I stuck to this pretty closely. I think I did three panels on the back peplum. Yeah. Um, and then the tops of the shoulders changed a little bit. I did that pretty abstract and kind of just, I don't know, slightly Art Deco inspired, but just on the fly, making it up as I go along. Not everything is super planned in my life. But just using those pattern pieces, I looked at the leather, fit them where I thought it would look best and cut them all out. Uh, just using which parts of the distressed leather I liked best. And then in order to prep everything, I realized, oh, I can't pin this because the holes in the leather aren't gonna go away if I pin it. Um, and I kind of looked up, how do we deal with these kind of things? And a lot of bag makers and stuff like that online seem to be saying you can like use a temporary kind of glue before you sew things as opposed to, um, you know, I mean, a lot of people use clips and things like that too. I just went with a little bit of PVA glue, which is what tacky glue is. I just did a little bit around the edges to glue these in place. Everything's gonna get sewn additionally to this. This is just what I'm doing instead of pinning these pieces of leather because there's no really way to hold them in place where I need them other than gluing them down or like using magnets of some kind, maybe, uh, but then they would stick to the cast iron machine. So I, I didn't really know any other way to do this. This seemed a good enough way to me. And in my like brief, quick looking it up online to see how this was done, a couple people are committed glue and I said, don't mind if I do. I'm sure there was like special glues and then someone was like, you could just use a PVA glue. And I was like, that I have. Um, here I forgot, I put glue on this piece before. I realized I didn't color in the sides of the leather. So because again, this leather is slightly thick, I wanted to color in the sides with a marker that matched the green foil on the effect on the outside of this. So um, that's what I'm doing here. I just have a permanent marker and I'm coloring in the sides of each piece to make sure that they coordinate with everything. Again, you can leave that contrast in there if you wanted to, especially if you're doing like, not that this isn't a pretty graphic contrast between the brownish greenish twill and the bright metallic leather, but if you're doing like a black and white, or even if you're doing like red leather on a black jacket and left the white on the outside, it would look quite good. So. You know, it's all up to you. Or of course you could do any color you want on the outside edge of that. But yes, try and remember to do that before I glue these things down. What an idea. Uh, so just coloring that in with a marker. I needed three markers in the end because this took a long time and the markers dried out quite quickly. Um, but glued everything down into temporary position. And then I left it, as you saw, weighted underneath books and heavy things here in the studio before I went over and top stitched every little piece of leather down onto the twill beneath. To do this on my machine, I used a top stitching thread in the top thread and then in the bobbin thread was just normal Gooderman thread that was just 
I tested a couple pieces on scrap and that was what worked best for me and this machine on this particular day for this particular project. Sometimes, I think I tested, you know, top stitching thread in both the bobbin and the top and that was, it was not having it. So in the end, I went with a, uh, the largest stitch length on my machine for top stitching this, I believe it was. And then um, the top stitching thread, the thicker thread on the top thread of the machine and regular thread in the bobbin. And just going around using the presser foot as a guide, it's about um, an eighth of an inch, basically. Using the presser foot as a guide, going around and just stitching that down flat onto my, uh, like patching it down basically, onto my twill pieces. I'm going to go over the first few stitches here and then I will cut my threads with a little bit of space. I'm going to bring all the thread to the back of this piece instead of doing like a bunch of back stitching or anything. I'm just gonna overlap a couple of stitches bring all my threads to the back side of the piece and tie those threads off on the back. This jacket will be fully lined, so none of these threads will have any friction against them or have the possibility of coming untied or anything. So I thought this was the best way to finish it so that it would be very clean on the outside. And of course, doing this, uh, both the gluing, because I had to glue things and then leave them overnight. So I did, you know, one, like the pieces for the front and put them under as many books as I had out, left them overnight until they dried did the next set next night. So I was kind of doing this in stages, <laughs> which was emblematic of the entire verdigree process because again, I made this jacket before I went to London and uh, I've been working on little pieces for this collection since the new year, basically. But I'm just gonna sew down all my leather that same way and bring all my threads to the back again. Just keep that same process going. I uh, do want to make a couple more of these. So I have to, uh, I don't know, stock up on patience in order to do that because this is actually very satisfying though even if it is time consuming the hardest part is making sure that you have every little piece of leather cut out and you have all the sides colored in before you start gluing you have everything glued everything's ready to go uh, this stitching actually doesn't take very much time the tying in the back takes time and the prep of this project takes more time than putting the project together the project it's pretty easy to put together if i was just doing this without all the leather piecing it would be quite simple you could also do this kind of piecing and decorative work with felt uh, would be a good idea, especially felt because it doesn't, anything that doesn't fray it along the edges would be good, but you could, you know, make these appliques and I don't know, like fray check the sides, bind the sides of them. You could use, of course, a vinyl as well. Um, anything that doesn't fray would be the best option. Um, definitely felt would work. It'd be nice to find like a wool felt and do it, uh, do this kind of technique with that. Here, I'm just lining up my backs to make sure everything is working out. Now these are the two center back pieces basically, and I'm going to sew my center back seam in them. Just proof of concept at this point, I'm thinking, all right, let's see how this works, keeping it an inch out from the seam. Will will be able to make this work. Let's hope so. Put those pins in at a diagonal maybe. So yes, I switched for all the sewing the leather down onto the twill. I used that top stitching thread on the top. For stitching all my seams, I switched back to using the Guterman both on the bobbin and on the top. So this is Guterman all purpose thread and back to 12 stitches per inch, my regular small stitch length for the actual structure of putting the jacket pieces together. So here's our first seam in this, ooh, exciting. And this is a, again, like a thicker cotton twill, which is like a denim-ish fabric. Uh, of course, in this dark army green brown color. It's green, it's brown. I think they called it green, but it's much more brown in reality, but you know, and it has a little bit of a brushed velvety surface on the top, which gives it a kind of soft touch, wintery feel, I felt. And I originally bought this fabric for a summer skirt, which is why, it never made it to be a summer skirt, so I pulled this out of the stash instead. And originally I thought I was going to try and make a clutch out of this leather, but then I thought, can I make a garment? Let's try it. I still need to learn to make handbags, but that is a another a step for another day. But yes, I'm just marking, again, I'm using chalk, uh, Taylor's chalk, to mark out where these go on the 12 pieces. So that's something that will brush off or wash off. And just a tiny bit of glue around the edges here, just to hold these in place. Again, I'm not trying to glue them down structurally. Everything's gonna get sewn. Um, so just a little bit of glue, trying to put it down where it needs to go first try. Um, that way I can go ahead and stitch everything back on. Again, just doing that in stages. So I did some pieces one day and some pieces the next day when everything was dry. This would be the next day from that to have everything be dry again. So I was working on other projects while I was doing this, like editing other videos and stuff while working on this, because it was a more of a multi-day project for me, uh, just by the necessity of glue drying and stuff, um, which is not usual for me because usually I make things in little marathons, uh, not a little bit a day. Um, that is how I recommend getting through sewing projects when you're having a bit of a block is to try and do like, just do one step. Tell yourself all you have to do is one step. And if you do that every day, you eventually will finish. Um, but normally 
I do things in a big block. But yes, once I have all my leather piecing on, I can actually start sewing the jacket together along the actual seams of this. This is a sleeve piece we're working on here now, I believe. Yes, the left and right lower sleeves, yeah. Same with this, same for the left and right. Just little chevron shaped pieces on the lower half of the sleeves here. I left the elbow kind of bend area ra relatively leather free, just because again, the twill was gonna move with my body better than the leather will. The leather still would, but again, I'm being cautious here. This is my first leather garment of any kind in any way, so I wanted it to go well. Um, but here are my back princess seams. So we have our side back going on to the center back there. Now from the front of this jacket, of course, I have two fronts. I cut the, the center front twice. Here I'm marking those notches on the decorated piece. The outside front has the leather, the inside front does not. Um, once again, just to conserve leather and also because that would become rather bulky in the front if you had both layers with the leather piecing on it. But I can go ahead and match up my notches for my princess seam and stitch the side front onto each center front. One center front has leather and one does not. You'll see what I mean in the end. Think of how a jacket overlaps. You're with me. Sometimes it helps to cut notches in the straighter piece over the bust like this. This one is working out okay. Cotton twill isn't too bad, unless it's like super finely woven. I've worked I've worked with some kind of weirdly evil cotton twills every once in a while. But that's probably just because it's a fabric I've worked with a lot. So everyone, you know, you're gonna encounter a mean fabric every once in a while where it's just like so tightly woven that it's become like crispy to the point of being annoying. Bring all that round of pinning over to the machine here and start stitching some princess seams, some sleeve seams, etc. Obviously we're stitching over a bust here with that curve, like so. Back over here on the eerily green lit 99K. This shop does have a lot of really cool effect leathers, uh, crackle effects, metallic effects, prints, um, all kinds of stuff over there. Um, I wish I could find vinyl that was this cool. I've, I, there's nothing that's uh, comparable in thickness and in the different effects that I've found. If you know of them, please let me know um, because I would love to have vinyl as an option instead. But um, I came across these leathers on Etsy and the sheer epicness of the effects they had available, I had to try. So here we are. I mean, I wear leather handbags and leather shoes, so it's not that different to me. Actually, I have a black leather jacket that is from <laughs> DJ Maxx. It's from Guess that I have worn since pff, midway through college. I've had the same leather jacket. So it's really lasted me, that $90 leather jacket from <laughs> TJ Maxx. Um, I got it before I went to England the first time. So I've had it for at least, you know, 12 years now or something like that. And uh, that thing has lasted me so long. It's so funny because my mom got one the same day and hers looks quite brand new compared to mine because I wore mine on like Splash Mountain and got completely soaked and I had to wring out my leather jacket. Uh, I didn't even know it was possible. So not a ride I'll miss. Um, not, never one of my favorites over there at uh, Disneyland. Um, I am from Southern California originally, so I am a bit of a Disney person, if you didn't know that about me. Fun fact, that is, I guess that's my, like, a guilty pleasure is Disneyland. You know, it's not really cool to be a big fan of a corporation like that, but, you know, we all have, a, each of us has a, a soft spot for one corporation, right? Right. But yes, I, uh, got completely soaked that time. That one time that was, pfft, again, ten years ago now. And I haven't forgiven them since, honestly. I need to go back, though, because they have a Star Wars land now. And this jacket would be perfect to wear to the Star Wars land, honestly. Galaxy's Edge. This would be a good sort of rebel cosplay kind of a jacket. Now you noticed I was clipping my curves and pressing my seams open in a shocking turn of events. And uh, now I'm going to top stitch all those seams, which, again, is so surprising for me. I know. I am just using the Guterman thread for top stitching these. I didn't switch back over to the top stitching thread. I could have, but at some point you're, you get really tired of switching the thread and rethreading the machine in and out. So when I could just use the same thread, I went with it because uh, switching back and forth between stitching the seams and then doing the top stitching uh, with switching the thread again was going to be too irritating for me. But once I had the center backs and side backs together, I could go ahead and put the back yoke on here, making sure that's lining up as best I can, hoping that everything has worked out. You know, uh, I haven't made this one before. That's the other thing to remember, too, is like uh, when I'm doing something like this, I did not make a mock up of this jacket pattern. I made this pattern, I did all of this work, and I did not make a mock-up. How do I, how can I feel confident in that? And that's because I'm starting with my basic block. I know my basic block already fits me. If anything, I added a half inch all around to this with the ease at the side seam. So if anything, this should be a tiny bit easy on me. Uh, it actually works out being quite uh, fitted just because this fabric is so thick, but yeah, it's fine. Um, but yeah, that's the best part about having a basic bodice block. You can do a new design and, you know, after some practice and after a while, you really become confident 
that that basic block, as long as you don't like forget to put seam allowance somewhere, or something really you know wackadoodle doesn't happen, uh, it will fit. You don't have to make mock-ups all the time. I only make mock-ups when I really shift something, um, either for the channel. Sometimes I'll try something that uh, I don't intend on making for myself, and so I will do a mock-up for that reason, just as a demonstration. Or if I'm just uns really unsure about a design detail and want to try it on my body first. That's the other thing too, is like, uh, you know, whether or not something's going to be flattering, it's not something I really hyper concern myself with, either that or it's just like ingrained into me what I like and don't like after years of sewing and being obsessed with fashion. So I don't really think, oh, maybe I better mock this up in case I don't think it's flattering on me. I also just don't think about that very often in general. Like, I want to look... If anything, it's like the Alexander McQueen has a quote about this. I'll put it on the screen now if I can find it about like wanting his women to be like more threatening rather than alluring. And I would like to be threatening and alluring if possible, um, or at least one or the other, you know, but never like uh, looking, I don't know, sexy or thin or whatever are never really my main goals. Uh, it's more just about like enjoying fabric, enjoying design and wanting to look sort of like some sort of an insect queen more than anything. I guess I'd rather look powerful than look sexy in any way, which I think some people think is the same thing. But of course, I'm ace and I do not. And that was your dose of philosophy for today while we're supposed to be sewing. Here I am sewing my shoulder and side seams, or pinning them at least, and I'll sew them in a minute. Again, sewing everything together and in the twill, not a problem. Everything's got its leather on it now, so it is a little bit stiff and annoying to move around, but eh. I forgot to sew my elbow darts, so let's go ahead and do that. My elbow darts in the back of this elbow darts. Apparently I can't say that today in the back bits of my sleeve before I sew the sleeve caps onto the tops of these. But, uh, you know, sew a seam, press it open. Hmm, pretty standard process for me. For me, it's always about pinning everything I can, taking it over to the machine, sewing everything, taking it over to the ironing board, taking all the pins out, because I, of course, sew over my pins, as you can see. Um, taking all the pins out, pressing all my seams open, clipping anything that needs to be clipped, corners, curves, uh, v-neck, like any inverse corners, I suppose, needs to be clipped. Uh, someone recently was asking a question about, you know, they're saying they always feel really cautious about clipping curves, and I just had it so drilled into me in fashion school, because you would lose marks real fast if you did not clip your curves. So, to me, clipping a curve is the most natural thing ever, because I, it was drilled into me. Um, usually, especially if a garment is lined, Unless it's a very loosely woven fabric, it doesn't ruin the integrity that much, especially if a seam's not going to get a ton of stress. So I don't usually clip like waist seams, you'll notice, or, like waist seam uh, stuff, because although it's a subtle curve, it's pretty subtle. Usually the fabric has enough given it to make it not necessary. Um, and that is a seam that's going to receive more stress than others. So, eh, but usually like a princess seam, you're not getting a lot of stress along the seam along the front princess line, you know? Um, or friction, so it should be fine. And better to have a slightly weakened seam that's completely smooth than a really rumpled, dis like mm, unfortunate looking seam that uh, is structurally sound, but you don't want to wear it because the garment is lumpy. That's just my opinion. Although that opinion has been influenced by several sewing instructors from when I was in fashion school. Here I am lining the peplum pieces, by the way. So this is the bottom of the jackets. I sewed these together along the side seams. They don't meet at the center back and they uh, overlap in the center front, so I just wanted to line these separately because you'll see why when I bag line the jacket in a minute here. So I've just sewn those to their lining, leaving the waist open. Again, I need to clip my corners and curves. Try and get that smooth and then I will top stitch all this so that it lays nice and flat. This is a rayon lining from Mood Fabrics. That's where I grabbed this one. Actually, this original brownish greenish twill, also from Mood. And then the leather again from Etsy, which I will link to below. It's an Italian Etsy store. Um, although these, they did ship remarkably quick all the way from Italy. So uh, impressive about that because I'm used to ordering some countries. It takes a long time to get stuff. Um, usually China is pretty fast. Uh, India is pretty dang slow. I have something coming. I have some, uh, specialty embroidery threads coming from Japan right now. And I guess they're not doing international airmail right now. At least the seller said they weren't. And so they were like, do you want like DHL, which is going to be a bajillion dollars? Or do you just want me to put it on the slow boat? And I said, put it on the boat, man. So who knows when I'll get those embroidery threads one day, maybe. But of course, international shipping is exceedingly expensive right now for everyone. So uh, whatever it takes to get it here. I'd rather just order something really in advance and then hope it doesn't fall off a shipping container into the middle of the ocean um, than pay the premium that it costs these days to ship anything internationally. I'm so sorry to all of you who are down there in Australia because I'm sure the cost to get anything down there is really irritating. 
But now that I have lined my peplum pieces and top stitched around the edges of that to keep it nice and smooth and keep that lining in place, I'm going to trim the lining a little bit up at the top of the waist here because, of course, having it curled to the inside just a little bit means it's a little bit longer up at the top here. I'm just going to trim that down. The tiny, it's like less than an eighth of an inch. Pin those two layers together so they don't get lost. And then I will line up the side seam of the peplum to the side seam of the jacket here and pin this, pin this along the waist of the jacket. Um, everything should line up with the center back hitting right next to the other center back, basically. Um, and then I can baste this on here before I go ahead and line the rest of the jacket. Um, I actually have to set my sleeves in and stuff as well. So there's that. And also make the rest of the lining. Uh, making the rest of the lining, obviously it's the same order of operations for sewing the twill layers of the jacket together. So here's the lining here. I'm setting the sleeves into the lining. Um, so I have a lining for the entire bodice of the jacket, the fronts and backs, yokes, princess seams, all that jazz. Um, but obviously with, there's no leather piecing on this, it would a lot quicker to go together um, in that same rayon lining. And then I did set the sleeves into the lining as well. So I better set my, set my sleeves, set my sleeves is hard to say. Say that 10 times fast. Better set my sleeves into the jacket as well. Of course, now with this thick twill and all this leather going on, it's really starting to get to be a stiff, weird sculpture to be sewing. So it starts to become more like hat making in the sense that like you're really working on a, a, a something that is three dimensional and no longer very flat. But I'll set my sleeves into this twill. Um, you can see I had that one line of gathering stitching into the top of my sleeve cap. That's not because these are gathered sleeves. It's just because there's a little bit of ease built into any sleeve pattern usually if it's been drafted well, hopefully. Um, there's a little bit of ease in that sleeve cap that just helps it curl over the shoulder. And you'll see that when I give this a press in a minute. But we can just set those sleeves in messily. Well, messily cinematography wise. Came out fine, as you can see. We have a sleeve that's in here. I'll just pull that gathering thread out now that we don't need it anymore. Our sleeve is in. Um, one of the ways I like to kind of make this, I don't know, be, behave nicely, I'm going to clip the underside of this arm side. Again, you this is an area that gets a little bit more stressed, but if you're not worried, like I'm using a polyester all-purpose thread, pretty strong. I've never had one break on me, knock on wood. Um, and a cotton twill that's quite stiff, like it's fine. Um, so I'm not worried about clipping the underarm there. I'd rather have it not feel bulky under my arm, honestly. Um, but I'm going to put a lot of steam on the inside of this sleeve here, stick my tailor's ham into it, and just press all that seam allowance out into the interior of the sleeve, just to kind of keep it smooth in that area. And if anything, that seam allowance helps provide a tiny bit of puff at the top of the sleeve to really hold out that sleeve cap and give a tiny bit of structure out there, especially because I didn't put shoulder pads in this. I just used the stiffness of the materials to provide the stiffness in the shoulder. But here I'm going to bag line this whole body, and I've just slipped the lining right sides together over the rest of the jacket. I've left the collar area, which we haven't even drafted the collar pattern yet, open, and I will bag line the rest of this buddy. So all the way around the outside edge, right sides together. That peplum again is folded up inside. The sleeves are all inside. We're basically making a giant jacket shaped pillow at this point. And then we will clip our curves and corners and I will turn this right side out, top stitch it of course, and then we'll put our collar on. The collar and hemming the sleeves are actually the last step of this. This is getting quite close to the end here, um, which is very satisfying after all that work because we, and yes, thank goodness it fits after all this work, right? If you're newer to pattern drafting, maybe make a mock-up. But luckily for me, I've been doing this for like 15 years now, which means I must be old, which it's true. It means I've been doing it since I was like 16, which is true. Although I didn't learn pattern drafting properly. Like I was playing around with making my own stuff without a pattern ever since I was like 12 and just playing around with tying fabric in different ways. But when I first got to fashion school, when I was 18, and I went to my... Uh, first pattern drafting class. It was within a couple of weeks. I was very nervous because I, pattern drafting, I found it very intimidating. Um, and when I started doing my lessons, I was like, oh no, is it is it really just this easy? And like, granted, I'll admit, it probably comes, I think at least a little bit easy to me. Like I think I have some natural proclivity for this, but in general, it is easier. Once you get past the fitting of the blocks, it is easier than you would think. And in, in fashion school, you don't fit a block to a person. You fit it to the standardized dress form. So if you use the standardized measurements in a book for how to draft something, it fits the dress form perfectly because that's where they got those standardized measurements. So um, in school, there's you don't even have to do the fitting part, which is a bummer because it would be nice if you learned how to fit things. But sadly, tailoring to real people, I don't think that was even an option at any school I've been to. Tailoring as in like how to tailor a jacket to the dress form, yes. But tailoring how to uh, fit clothes to different shapes and proportions and sizes of body, no, was not a class 
anywhere I've ever seen on any curriculum. And I've been to fashion school in California, in Colorado, in London, and in Paris. And I've never seen a class like that. Would be nice though. Just drafting a quick stand color over here. You use the measurement of the neckline from the front and back to do this. Um, I can link a video in the description where I go through this with a little bit more detail. I need to do a video that's just a stand color because I always say that. I always try and find a video where I've done it properly because I never take the time to actually explain these. It's because they're, again, deceptively simple. It's not actually very hard to do these little stand collars. So do one of those real fast. And then again, I need to cut a piece of leather to go on this too. So let me find a scrap that's big enough here. I put all these into a bag because this is all scraps that's big enough to do this again with some other project. Maybe even making a clutch handbag, which would be nice. But I need to cut two of the collar piece along the fold, center back along the fold, out of our cotton twill here. And then one out of leather to accent that. I'm just going to line this with the cotton twill. And this fabric is so, uh, you know, cushy <laughs> and thick on the stiff and thicker side that I did not bother to interface this in any way. If I'm doing a stand collar out of something like a silk taffeta or something, usually I will interline and interface that. Um, but I use a lot of thicker fabrics. I would say average thickness fabrics, but this is on the extra side even. And I didn't even make a pattern piece for doing the collar. I just cut out the exact same collar out of leather and then cut off three quarters of an inch all around the edges. So there's gonna be less of a seam allowance or like less of a buffer between this piece of leather and the rest, but that's just because this piece was so small. Um, so that was how I got around that one. Again, I need to color in my edges. Just doing that with my marker here. I had to go back to the store and grab more of these markers because I thought for some reason having one was going to be enough. Now I know better. Grab grab a handful if I'm going to be doing it this way. I'm sure there's an official product for doing that. The handbag people probably know it. But, uh, you know, doing I'm making it up as I go. Again, uh, how many times will I say it? It's just true. Sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, or so, the answer to the question why is... God, because I, I thought it would work. And sometimes, you know, early on in my sewing career, <clears throat> as it were, some, not all those things worked, but we, I've been here a while. Most of the time when I have an idea of how I'm going to do something, it works out. Again, knock on wood, really jinxing it here today. But now that I have that piece with its applique of leather, applique, I haven't used that word much in this video, but that's basically what all of this is. Um... <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go ahead and sew the outside edge and the ends of my collar together. I'm going to leave the part that's going to be sewn to the neckline open for reasons which will become eventually obvious. You could either turn the collar edge to finish this off inside or turn the lining edge. In the end, I think I do turn the lining edge this time, but you could technically do either. There's a slight curve on the edge of this collar, so I'm going to go ahead and clip that, clip my corners, press this all nicely. I will top stitch it as well before we put this onto the jacket. Of course, the jacket, now that it's been bag lined and I top stitched the edge the same way I had done the peplum, it's otherwise ready to go. So it just needs this collar up at the, to finish the neckline. And then again, the sleeve hems, which I'll just stitch by hand. I'll show you that eventually here. Find the center of my collar here. Just put a pin there, line that up with the center back of my jacket. I'm going to stitch this collar onto just the twill slash leather layer. So I'm going to leave the lining free on the inside because again, I will use that to finish this area off once this collar is sewn on. But yeah, this is... You know, the jacket really is all together now, so it's a stiff, big, giant piece of cotton and leather that is not very moldable at this point, so it's kind of fiddly to work with, but worth worth the uh, manhandling that you have to do, because I'm so happy with how this jacket came out. I love it so much. I really need to make another one uh, in a more, like, black and gray kind of colorway, because I don't always wear brown. Although this kind of, maybe I could wear it with black because it's not technically brown. I don't know, black and brown, I feel like I have to mix very intentionally. Otherwise it just looks like, you know, I got dressed in the dark, but I'll get there. Sewing that on over here on the machine, half inch seam allowance as always. This neckline is of course quite curved, so I'm gonna put some clips in here and then I'm actually gonna grade this seam a little, cut away some of the seam allowance because it's all gonna be inside the lining anyway. And it's just so thick. Um, three layers of this twill up here. Yeah, it's just too much. So I'm gonna cut away some of the seam allowance, cut it down to a quarter inch, just so that this grades a little. Uh, you can grade all three layers and like do it really smoothly if you want, if you are more patient than I am. Um, but I'm just gonna give that a little bit of a grade because it's just so, you know, too much in here. Give that another press. And then yes, I need to clip the curves of my lining as well, because it will not fold under a half inch without clipping the curves. Because again, the neckline is too curvy. But just clip that, 
fold it under a half inch and then pin it along the seam line for where the collar got attached to the jacket. And uh, this is going to be one of those shots where I, in editing, I'm thinking, what a great director of photography you are with a shot of the back of the sleeve of your shirt. We don't even get to see the nice tattoo that's there. We get nothing. We get cat haired covered Arches National Park t-shirt. That's what we get. Such a shame. So yeah, I'm turning this all in so that it's smooth along the collar and then I will hand slip stitch this all shut in here, honestly, and then give it a nice finished press up here. Hope for the best. So yes, just need a hand sew along the collar up there and then I needed to hem my sleeves. So I've got the sleeves here. Again, those are each just folded to the inside a half inch, pinned to one another. I did the lining a tiny bit shorter and I slip stitched that all shut. And as far as closures go on this jacket, I used these extra large antique brass colored hooks and eyes that I found at Joann's. I might put two more on here. This was like the kind of the bare minimum to see if I needed more. I am probably will put another one at the waist and maybe even one at the bust. Not sure, I might just put two more um, along this just to really secure it a little bit better so it stays smooth while I'm wearing it. But yes, this jacket, I can wear the lapels folded back if I wanted to. This isn't the world's prettiest lining. It looks good here, but that's, I don't know, maybe you put a ring light on anything and it looks more flattering. Um, that's At least it works for people. Uh, the ring light really solves so many skin issues. It's, it makes you look like you have a filter even when you don't have a filter on. But here is this finished jacket on the mannequin for which it is too big for. And then uh, you will see it again on me, of course, from the Verdigree lookbook. And I'm really excited to pair this with more kind of femme looks in the future. I did this in a bit more of a mask way, this lookbook. But next time, I think with a pencil skirt or a dress underneath, it'll look quite sharp as well. It wasn't actually very difficult to work with the leather at all. It just was a time consuming project because of all the pieces going on and keeping everything straight. It was more the organization than the practicality of it that was difficult. So just keeping everything in order in my mind was more the trouble as opposed to actually working with the material itself. But I hope some of you enjoyed seeing how this project came together. And thank you as always for watching today. I'll be back with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon. So I'll see you then. Bye.